Are you sick of the same boring Spanish landscapes? Struggling to make the money you want? Looking to save others from religious persecution? Then come join Christopher Columbus and his team of experts on the voyage of a lifetime west to India. Forge new relationships with the locals and be among the first to discover a whole new sea passage to Asia. Return home a new man with countless riches, a sense of accomplishment and a killer tan. This message paid for by Her Majesty Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. A false promise, countless riches and the voyage of a lifetime. As we delve into a personal logbook and analyze the horrors of the journey and changing motivations, we will discover if it was really a voyage of the damned. Today, we uncover Christopher Columbus. fourteen ninety AD, a time of great change as Portugal continued their expansion through northern Africa. A time of wealth and luxury as Eastern trade continued to flourish. A time of national celebration as Spain brings their reconquista to an end. A time that brought about a heroic age of discovery and led to an event hailed as a historical watershed of global magnitude. But was that fateful voyage of fourteen ninety two as positive as Columbus described it as? And what is the motivation behind his treatment and description of the indigenous people he encountered? Is he ultimately responsible for the terrible evil that would follow? To answer these questions, we must first understand the context of his original voyage, taking us back to the 3rd of August, 1492. After failing to secure funding for his voyage from both the English and the Portuguese, Columbus turned to the Spanish, receiving a meeting with Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. They financed his trip, agreeing to allow him governing over any lands he discovered, as well as 10% of any gold, silver, or spices he came across. This decision, and the subsequent monetary backing it brought about, set a precedent for Columbus's voyage. The pressure to find something worthwhile had begun. Primary motivation for the voyage was the same as most in the 1490s, discovering a new sea route to get to China and India, where the wealthy items were shipped for commerce, and thus cut out any middleman and the subsequent costs that would incur, monopolizing the eastern trade. It is important to note the original intent behind Columbus's exploration was one of wealth. Perhaps this overwhelming greed and expectation of money had an impact on Columbus when he finally arrived in the Caribbean. Did his motivation turn to a more evil intent? Landing on an undisclosed island in the Bahamas, Columbus and his crew, who by now were restless and tired by months of travel, set about interacting with the locals. But what do we really know about those they met? When the Spanish explorers arrived to their supposed new land, the Caribbean island was already occupied by the Taino people, a society who lived life very differently to those of the Maya or Aztecs near to them. With no major cities, most islands held small towns of thatched roof houses, led by a sheath of either gender who was afforded unique allowances, and various farms growing non-European fruits and vegetables like corn, sweet potatoes, beans, and pineapples. Despite their isolated locations, the Spanish were not the first to engage with the Taino people. Their enormous ocean-ready canoes allowed them to travel to other continental areas in the north and south to trade for clothes, ornaments, and tobacco. It was, however, the Spanish explorers who were the first to exploit the Taino for their valuables. It is here where we can visit and analyze some of the most damning evidence to Columbus's trial, his personal logbook. As I saw that they were friendly to us and perceived that they could be much more easily converted to our holy faith and would be good servants, and I am of the opinion that they would very readily become Christians, as they appear to have no religion. Trade was carried on with the utmost goodwill. But they seemed, on the whole to me, to be a very poor people. They all go weapons, weapons. they have none, nor are they acquainted with them. For I showed them swords, which they grasped by the blades, and they are all of a good size and stature, and handsomely formed, well made, with fine shapes and faces.
Among the litany of adjectives Columbus was provided when the indigenous people inhabiting the new land they supposedly discovered were described to him, there is a common theme running throughout, that of weakness and potential for manipulation, conquering, and exploitation. It is clear that in the various correspondence Columbus sent to his benefactors, he highlighted these same traits, but for what reasons? Perhaps it is a response to their true goals. In a shocking interview with Felipe Fernandez Armesto, we received this answer. This established them as physically normal, not monstrous, and so qualified them as suitable converts to Christianity, which was a professed objective of Columbus's royal patrons. Is this religious slant really as present as Felipe believed? A further analysis of his descriptive choices unveiled a significant bias, perhaps bordering on religious obsession. But they seemed, on the whole to me, to be a very poor people. They all go completely naked. The consistent mention of the indigenous people's nudity brings up an immediate red flag. European readers would immediately recognise this implication as that of the Golden Age model. Man and woman living in harmony with nature without need for clothing. A Christian ideal. However, this nudity was also immediately associative of the savagery of the wild man image. Columbus didn't seem to reflect this belief, though. They are all of a good size and stature, and handsomely formed. Well made, with fine shapes and faces. Struggling to apply this understanding due to the Taino's healthy appearance, perhaps his constant praising of their physicality was a result of this contrast of confusion. But was Christianity the only objective Columbus had in mind? Columbus was on the lookout for ways of manipulating the natives for profit. The natives' ignorance of warfare established their innocent credentials, but also made them easy to conquer. Weapons? They have none, nor are they acquainted with them, for I showed them swords which they grasped by the blades and cut themselves through ignorance. Though he professes their intelligence, likely to enhance how impressive his subsequent conquering would be, Columbus decided to stress the docility and ignorance of the Taino people, a suspiciously idyllic presentation of a society easy to conquer, one that would take a dark turn after shocking events. But is there a third, more prevalent motivation? Felipe left us with a fascinating thought. The search for gold and for Asiatic lands began the day after his arrival. Years later, further allegations would surface of Columbus's exploitative nature. Gold was his, and Spain's. Obsession, you know. They were forever asking them with words and grunts and gestures where the gold was. Some of these people wore little gold ornaments in their ears or noses. Columbus had some of them captured, and with those ornaments as a reference, tried to have them guide him to the source of the gold. True to this sentiment, a closer analysis of Columbus's letters home reveals strong evidence for this greed as primary motivation, despite his self wrote contradictions to the exploitative nature of his unjust trading process. Thus they bartered like idiots, cotton and gold, for fragments of bows, glasses, bottles and jars, which I forbade as being unjust, and myself gave them many beautiful and acceptable articles which I brought with me, taking nothing from them in return. I did this in order that I might the more easily conciliate them, that they might be led to become Christians, and be inclined to entertain a regard for the king and queen. Columbus, hiding behind the mask of religious motivation, a process which he conceives to be the principal wish of our most serene king, namely, the conversion of these people to the holy faith of Christ, actually belies a vicious and methodical goal to systematically plunder the found land, stealing all natural resources from right under their golden nose ornaments. Working directly with Columbus's letters, Beatrice Pastor Bodmer uncovered a shocking revelation. Discovery thus becomes a process of elimination. Columbus briefly inventories each island in regard to the fertility of the land, the level of civilization, the dress habits of the people, the signs of precious metals, before moving on. He trusts in God to guide him towards his goal. And it is gold because I showed them some pieces of gold which I have. I cannot fail with the aid of our Lord to find the place whence it comes.
This specific goal became even more apparent when Beatrice turned the page to the next day's logbook entry, identifying the following passage as entirely indicative of his methodical nature. Since I see that here there is no gold mine, I say that it is not right to delay, but to go on our way and to discover much land until a very profitable land is reached. Columbus, a man driven by his golden greed, discovering an island of mythical great wealth and the people to provide it to him, a man with a quota to fill and royal benefactors to please. Other detectives sharply identified his desperate failure in this regard, commenting on the pleasure offered by his initial fruitful commerce being tempered once he realized the Taino he was trading with were not the wealthy agents he had sought. The original intention of taking samples back to Spain of everything he found that could be traded or otherwise turned into profit turned dark with his choice to include people in this thieving, perhaps explaining his obsession with such objectifying adjectives when describing the indigenous people. Upon a later interview, Felipe expanded upon this point. He also offloaded a good deal of his truck for sufficient gold to impress the monarchs on his homecoming, though he was unable to find any large-scale exploitable source. While he could watch the Indians pan the river for small quantities, the mine he repeatedly wished for eluded him. It seemed pretty clear at this point where his real motivations were, and the devastating consequences the increased pressure and unfounded expectations brought about, and the subsequent terrible events that occurred as a result of this. Though, just as the case was ready to close, Leonardo Olschke revealed a new analysis of the evidence that flipped it on its head and blew it wide open. People ignore the fact that the thirst for gold and similar visions, more or less ecstatic, of wealth and luster, constituted in the age of the discoveries the principal economic inducement that inspired these explorative voyages. Columbus started from Spain with just such visions and expectations in his mind, and no premature disappointment was able to shake his confidence. Gold represented the only profit immediately realizable of such costly enterprises. This is the simple and true reason for the predominance of the gold motif in Columbus' journal, quite apart from pretended racial influences or personal instincts. There is an affecting contrast between his visionary expectations and the unadorned reality which he describes with such symptomatic details. A small piece of gold hanging from a hole which some of the natives had in the nose was for him on the first day of his stay in the West Indies indisputable proof of the existence in that country of that precious metal. And on the other hand, the entire equipment of the Indian errant in his boat was sufficient to reveal to the Catholic sovereigns and to every reader of the journal the poverty and fragility of these new subjects of the Spanish crown. Thus we see that it was far from the Admiral's intention to mislead his sovereigns by creating false impressions. We must recognize that he composed his journal in a spirit of perfect sincerity. Is it possible that Columbus was simply pursuing the fame and fortune such a significant discovery would bring about? Is his treatment and description of the Tainos explained away by this discovery? And what would become of his future? As of 1493, Columbus is still at large, sailing on the high seas of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm.